A Fall of Moon Dust by Arthur C. Clarke, adapted for radio by Andrew Lynch, with David Buck as Captain Pat Harris, Barry Foster as Engineer Jim Lawrence, Roland Caram as Tourist Commissioner Davis, Bill Simpson as Commodore Hanstein, Richard Pearson as Dr. Lawson, James Aubrey as Morris Spencer, Libby Morris as Myrie Schuster, Harry Tarb as Irving Schuster, and Jane Knowles as Stewardess Sue Wilkins. A Fall of Moon Dust. Okay. That's good. We're going to be Welcome aboard, sir. Madam. Oh, hi. Hi. Hope the ship's big enough to take me, Irving. Seems awful small. Stop worrying, Myra. I just don't want to get stuck in a seat. Everywhere we go, you say that. It's not happened yet. Mm, there's always a first time. Look, we didn't come all the way to the moon for you to get stuck in a seat. Just enjoy the cruise. How long is the trip expected to last, young lady? Four hours, madam. Uh, do we sit anywhere? Yes, Lini has been designed to give a panoramic view for all its passengers. Well, I'll stay here at the front, if you don't mind. I'm sure you'll be very comfortable. Well, welcome aboard, sir. Hello. Hi there. Welcome aboard. My name is Jaya Vardhanan. Uh, do I sit uh, anywhere? Just sit anywhere, sir. All <laughs> seats have a perfect view. Thank you. Have you got room for your knees? Are they ship shaped sir? Yes, Captain Harris. Full compliment, as usual. Good. Catering facilities checked? Of course. I'd, uh, I'd like the seafood morning, if that's possible. I'll see what I can do, Pat. Good. i complete my pre-cruise checks. These are nice seats. Welcome aboard. Oh, I hope I haven't kept you waiting, young lady. No, sir. You are the last, but not late. Ah. You'll find a seat down on the right there. Thank you. That'll be fine. Excuse me. Uh, the young man in uniform who went through to the front... Uh, Captain Harris has just gone to the bridge. Are you the only two crew members? That's right. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Don't worry. The Cellini's a very simple ship to operate. Don't think I'm making a fuss, miss, but... That door seems a bit flimsy. I mean, compared with an aircraft door back on Earth. The moon creates her own conditions. Just relax and enjoy the trip. Cellini's been through the most rigorous safety checks. You okay, Myra? Uh, fine, Irving. These seats are very comfortable. Yeah, it's a neat little ship. I think that's one of the things I like best about the moon. <laughs> Everything is so clean. Uh, we're a long way from 39th. New York's still home. I hope the apartment's okay. David will look after everything. Welcome aboard, Cellini. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Sue, and Captain Harris and I are pleased you could join us on the only sightseeing trip across a lunar sea. We shall be away from Port Roris about four hours, and our first objective will be Crater Lake, where we will have a breathtaking view of the mountains of inaccessibility. To reach our destination, we shall travel across the Sea of Thirst, ironically named because it is formed from the driest dust imaginable. <laughs> a vacuum-packed souvenir awaits you at Port Roris on our return. Right. The surface temperature of the sea at this moment is around 300 below zero. God. Wow. You wanted to get away from the heat, Myra. <laughs> we are rather proud of Cellini. She's a unique craft even for the 21st century. Compact, extremely simple to operate, and her terminology will be familiar to most of you as it's taken from Earth maritime phraseology. We refer to her fore and aft, port, starboard, bridge, and portholes. She is propelled by electric motors that drive fans below the dust surface. But unlike conventional sea craft, there is no discomfort to be experienced by erratic motion. There are no waves, and seasickness is something we have never experienced. <laughs> if during the trip you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. A three-course meal incorporated in the price of your cruise ticket will be served in about an hour and a half from now. Enjoy your trip, everyone, and I'll now hand you over to Captain Harris. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Captain Pat Harris speaking to you from the bridge. 
If you would care to swivel your seats to the rear, you will observe the domes of Port Morris dropping swiftly from the skyline. You have all no doubt observed the stars from the clarity of space and been dazzled by the face of the mother planet, but this is a new experience for you. We are now traveling on neither land nor sea or space, but a little of each. No sea on earth could ever be as calm as this. We'll stop for a moment and let you experience how still and placid the lunar surface can be. Isn't it so quiet and peaceful? Ghostly, still grayness. This is the real face of the moon. That view hasn't changed for billions of years. It's an enormous thought, isn't it? Now, uh, just how far do you imagine the horizon is? That's miles away. Miles away. <laughs> Believe it or not, only three kilometers. It, it looks a couple of light years away, but if you could walk on this stuff, you'd be there in 20 minutes. Imagine. We'll move on, and I'll leave Sue to explain how the sea was formed. Most of the moon is covered by a thin layer of dust, usually no more than a few millimeters in depth. Some of the debris fell from the stars when meteorites rained on the unprotected surface over at least five billion years. Some has flaked from lunar rocks as they expanded and contracted in the fierce climatic conditions. It's more liquid than sand or anything similar. It flows quicker than syrup and just slower than water. Over the ages, it has flowed down from the mountains into the lowlands to form pools and lakes. The first explorers expected this, but the Sea of Thirst was a surprise because of its size. Terrific. And ahead we now see the mountains of inaccessibility, oh, well, yeah. so-called yeah. because they are entirely surrounded by sea. Have they ever been climbed? No, they haven't. Aren't they a wonderful sight? Oh, I'll go through to the bridge and put the main lights out to give you a better view and leave you to take in the haunting beauty. Look. I've never seen anything like that. What are the passengers like? They seem an ordinary bunch. There's one man I seem to recognize from somewhere, but I can't place him. Well, point him out when I do my walkabout. Uh, are you... a Busy later. I, after the trip, I mean. Well, I, I said I'd go and see the latest Earth video with a friend. Why do you ask? I'm thinking of trying the new restaurant that's opened in Clavia City. I, I, I thought you might like to join me. I went three or four days ago. It's very good. Oh. Oh, uh, some other time then. That'd be nice. I don't think you'll need to eat out tonight. There's plenty of seafood Mornay aboard. Good. Oh, there's a Miss Morley sat front port who asked who you were. Yeah, I think I noticed her. Why do they always look like that? Now then, Captain, diplomacy and charm. Remember your code of conduct. I'd better get back to them. Mm. <laughs> Out of this world. <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? That man has to travel so far from the fields, lakes and forests to appreciate the real beauty of his own world. Are you a poet? <laughs> no, man. I just never dreamed it could look so beautiful. Bluey green crescent hanging in space. Do you think David's looking up at the moon, Irving? I hope he's looking after the office. <laughs> Forget the office. That's what we came here for. Rest, the doctor said. You tell me. And who's worrying about the apartment? Not now. I'm looking at a wonderful world. Yeah. Are you New Yorkers? How'd you guess? Oh, I worked in the Bronx for a while. You're not American. No. Australian, one of the originals. Ah. Long way from the Big Apple. Nobody calls it that anymore. We can almost see both our homes from here. I I'm Irving's sister. This is my wife, Myra. Oh, I'm oh, pleased to meet you. I'm Duncan McKenzie. It's our first trip to the moon. Really? Our first trip anywhere for years. Wow. The doctor, a personal friend, yeah. says, Irving, you have a fine son to take care of your business. Take a vacation. Next year, maybe, he says. So, here we are. <laughs> Always next year. So now it's next year. And you, first trip? Oh, yeah. I've been promising myself this for a long time. You're alone? You don't have a wife with you? Myra. Myra. Hey. 
Excuse me, sir. Please don't think me impertinent, but have we met before? Oh, I'm sure I couldn't have forgotten such a charming lady. Sorry, I rarely forget a face. Occupational hazard. You must remind me of someone else. <laughs> I just seem to have that sort of face. I'll get the cans in my bag. No, never. Can you get the picture? Are you sure you shouldn't be at the front, Captain? <laughs> We're quite safe on automatic pilot for another seven minutes, Miss Moy. We're traveling a well-trodden route in a straight line. But... What's that? Uh, sorry? Up ahead. Captain, we're heading straight into it. Irving! Irving, there's a hole in the sea! It'll be planned, Myra. We'll be programmed to go around it. Pat, Pat, what is it? Oh, God, I don't know. I'm going to the bridge. No, no, we're no, 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 My God! Pat, we're sinking. What's happening? Hang on, Sue, I'm trying to lift her. We're going down! Look at the potholes. The dust is halfway up the glass. Chief Engineer Lawrence, Mr. Davis. Oh, Jim, good of you to come. Uh, take a seat. I don't have long. What can I do for you, Rex? You've time for some tourist office refreshment, I'm sure. Mm. And uh, would you please? Yes, sir. Are you buttering me up for something, Rex? <laughs> Just being courteous to a fellow member of the moon management team. Always the PR man. Come on, let's have it. <laughs> I had a stroll through the park earlier and happened to bump into the chief administrator. He's rather taken with the park, Jim, particularly impressed by the 15-metre sunflowers. And the back-projected clouds, no doubt. It must be nice to have the time to admire them. Oh, those clouds are lovely. You should dream a little. I can look at clouds on Earth and listen to birds. Well, perhaps you'd like something else. A thunderstorm, maybe? No, thanks. So, what did the chief have to say? We discussed an idea for tourism. Oh, you know my views on tourism. Just an additional headache we can live without. Oh, no, we can't. It's our lifeblood here on the moon, Jim. The only way we can be independent of Earth. This idea would benefit both our departments. Go on, Rex, I'm listening. The, uh, the water skiing champion of Australia has contacted me to ask if anyone has ever skied on the Sea of Thirst. I thought you wanted me here for something serious. I am serious. It could be a whole new sport. Is it... Technically possible. That's all I want to know. It's probably just a matter of being able to maintain speed and maneuverability. I just don't know. We'd have to do some experiments. Could Cellini do it? It's possible. All I can see from my department's point of view is headaches. I'm running on a shoestring as it is. Exactly, Jim. The tourists bring the money in. Any extra revenue generated by a fresh influx would be used to benefit both our departments. When I've got time, I'll see what I can do, all right? That's all I'm asking. Excuse me, sir. Red priority column seven. Uh, put it through, Anne. Chief Engineer Lawrence has the same clearance as me. It, it's for Chief Engineer Lawrence. Oh, uh, fine, fine. Put it through, Anne. Uh, call for you on seven, Jim. Thank you. Lawrence, yes. <clears throat> How long ago? No answer whatsoever. Try the moon crash band, Ed. You did. Right. See you in control in a couple of minutes. Trouble? That was Ed, my number one. It's probably a false alarm, but I'd better get down to control. Cellini hasn't made a routine call. Oh, what do you think could have happened? I'm going to find out. I'll come with you. If anything has happened to her out there, we can only reach her with the dust skis. I've said all along we should have had two dust cruisers operational before we started these trips. Some degree more. That's the sort of equipment we could buy with any additional revenue. Ed, what's the problem? The 1900 hour signal came in bang on time. Uh, that was here. Mm -hmm. Nothing at uh, 2000. That's when they called me. I've had the instrument guys check it out our end and it's all right. We tried to contact her on her regular frequency and drew a blank. Mm. We've scanned the adjoining bands and again nothing. That's when I called you. And nothing on the moon crash band? Uh, not yet. If she travelled from the 1900 signal until now, how far away from the last point of contact could she be? That out. She'd only have travelled 80 kilometres, but she won't be travelling that fast in the sightseeing trip. Right, if we draw a circle with her position at 1900 hours as its centre and an 80 kilometre radius, she's got to be in there somewhere. Then if we concentrate on this arc in the direction she's travelling, that'll cut down the odds for finding her. Let's not provoke publicity over this. Mm. Uh, after all, it's probably just a simple breakdown. Yes, yes, but we'll dispatch the dust keys anyway. 
Even if it is a false alarm, it's good training. How long before we know? It will take a while to search several thousand square kilometers at night. Ed, get them started in this area. I'll prepare for us to travel to Port Roris in a suborbital, just in case we're needed. Okay, Chief. What could have happened? I don't know. If it isn't a communications breakdown, there can only be a few possibilities. It was sudden. An explosion, maybe. I'd better set up a meeting with the legal department. Do you think we should tell the chief administrator? I'll leave that to you. Maybe he's wandering around your park somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. This won't do the tourist industry any good. You should be worrying about the tourists that went out on Salini. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah. I'll contact Port Roris and make sure they all sign their indemnity forms. If it came to the worst, we could be sued for billions. That isn't what I meant. Let's hope they've just hit something and put their communications out of action. Excuse me, Chief. I've had an idea. I'm listening, Ed. Why don't we try a Lagrange satellite? The astronomers up there might be able to see something. At night? From 50,000 kilometres? That's worth a try. Selene's searchlights could still be burning and they'd easily spot that on the sea. Contact them, Ed. I'll get our transport arranged to Port Roris. Dr Lawson? Yes, yes. What is it? I'm very sorry to disturb you, Doctor, but we've received a priority red signal from Lunar Traffic Control, Earthside North. Traffic Control? I'm an astronomer, not a parking attendant. What do they want? A dust cruiser, the Selene, has gone missing on a sightseeing trip across the Sea of Thirst. Twenty-two people on board. Traffic Control thought there may be a chance we'd spot her lights through the telescope. Ah, oh, I don't know. I'm supposed to be carrying out serious scientific research. Not looking for a busload of lost pleasure seekers? Yes, Doctor. 100 centimetre telescope. Beautiful instrument. Designed to look at objects billions of times further away from us than the moon. Here we are, like a ping-pong ball, perpetually balanced between Earth and the moon. Where do you say that thing was supposed to be? The Sea of Thirst, Doctor. I've brought a map. Map? Map? <laughs> they need a map? Let's look at that view on the screen. That's a sea of rains. Those craters are Archimedes, Plato, Aristolus, and Eudoxus. Marvellous! Even on low par. Yes. Shouldn't we be scanning the dark section, Dr Lawson? Of course we should. That's where we're going. Now, it's a big place to see a thirst. You have any coordinates? Yes, Doctor. Well, punch them in. You're expected now to work this thing. Yes, Doctor. There. It's very dark. Well, of course it's dark. It's night time. Scan slowly. What was that? What? Where? A bright light. It could have been a searchlight. Well, trace it back. Very slowly. There. Much too bright. Those are the lights of Port Roris. Now, if she's on the Sea of Thirst, we should locate her with a light amplifier or a radiation detector. I can't see. Quiet. Quiet, everyone, please. I think we've stopped moving now. Is anyone injured? No. Just make sure that everyone within touching distance of you is conscious. I'm going to reset the main lights and the purification system. Irving, you all right? I'm okay. Are you? Yeah. Mr. Mackenzie? Oh, fine. Look at the porthouse. Oh, we're buried. Oh, God, we're buried. And Miss Morley, are you all right? We are buried, aren't we? Oh. oh. Yes, we are under the surface, but we can't be very deep. At least we now have light. <laughs> How is everybody, Sue? At the worst, shaken, I think. Well, if the food's still servable, this might not be a bad time to serve it. I'll see what I can do. Uh, good, good. Uh, uh, could I have your attention, please? Sure. Uh, we are still in one piece, and no one is worse than a little shocked, as far as I can see. Right. If anyone does need first aid, Sue is a trained nurse, so speak up. Right. I, I think we've been unfortunate to have been caught in some sort of landslip or moonquake. There's no need to be alarmed. Even if we can't get out under our own power, Port Roris will soon have someone here. Meanwhile, Sue is about to serve refreshments, so I suggest you all relax and dial contact base. <laughs> so.
Salini to Port Roris. Salini to Port Roris. Come in, please. Food's underway. Are you through? Not yet. What's happened? Any ideas? I'm not sure. Some sort of landslip. Salini to Port Roris. Come in, please. Perhaps the radio's damaged. Possibly. I'm getting an outside pressure reading, which indicates we're deeper than I had first thought. Well, how deep? Well, at a rough estimate, I'd say about ten meters. As much as that. Is everything else all right? All equipment appears to be functional. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, sir. No passengers allowed in here. No, that's all right, Sue. No, I don't want to intrude, Captain. Selina is your ship. I thought I'd introduce myself in case I can be of some assistance. Glad to have you aboard, Commodore. Commodore? Commodore Hanstein. The man who led the first expedition to Pluto. I thought I recognized you, but your name didn't ring a bell from the passenger list. Oh, I've shaved off my beard. My alias is Hanson. Since my retirement, I've tried to do some quiet sightseeing. <laughs> uh, sorry about this, Commodore. No, it's not your fault. How desperate is the situation? I'll carry on with the meeting. Yeah, fine, Sue. Uh, we're deeper than I first thought. My guess is about ten meters. Doesn't sound too good. We aren't too far from Port Roris. They should find us fairly quickly. My experience tells me to look on the black side. How long could we last if we had to? Oh, oxygen would be the limiting factor. We've enough for about seven days, Earth days, that is, provided there are no leaks and she seems sound enough. What about food, water and power? No problem. We carry the compulsory emergency supply rations. We can purify all the water we need and there's ample power now that the main motors are shut down. Any luck with the radio? I think the dust's blanketed everything out. I've left the beacon on moon crash. If anything can get through, it'll be that. If they had to find us any other way, any estimate how long it would take? Well, the search would have begun as soon as our 2000 signal was missed. They all know our general area, but we'll have sunk without trace. In the meantime, you've got to keep the customers happy. Why not give them a pep talk about the search procedure? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll do that, Commodore. Thank uh, you. Best not to give the impression somebody will be knocking on the door in half an hour, though. It would make it difficult if we had to wait a day or two. Can't see a thing. Can you? I felt sure we'd find something after the photographs had gone through computer enhancement, but it's just as if the sea hasn't been touched for hundreds of years. Billions of years. In the earth light, it'll be possible to see her shadow clearly. If not, then we can assume she came to grief in this area. Put these through the enhancer, Ingrid. Right. Crater Lake? In the middle of the mountains? Well, it's far more logical to assume she'd have an accident where always boulders are strewn about the place than in the open sea where she'd be unobstructed. Mm. It's still very black, Doctor. Mm. No light at all. Scores of isolated crags and boulders. You see, all this area is blocked from us by the mountains. The only chance there is to investigate at ground level. Inform Earthside Control and give them our interim report. Are we giving up, Dr Lawson? Good Lord, no. Just getting interesting. Commissioner Davis. Yes, Anne? The uh, copy of the report from the Lagrange satellites through on Telfax. Oh, any news? No, they haven't seen anything at all. This has happened at a very bad time. Is that the passenger list? Yes, sir. Um, th there's an appendix. Hell, that's all I need. Commodore Hanstein's on board, travelling under an assumed name. The Commodore Hanstein? Imagine what that's going to do to our public image. Lawrence should have arrived at Port Roris by now. Make sure he's got all this information. Yes, sir. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the position. We're only about 60 kilometres from base, three from the mountains of inaccessibility, and we are in no immediate danger. That's right. But how long, Captain? As I said earlier, I've no reason to believe we won't be located quite soon. Shouldn't someone be on the bridge by the radio? No, I've boosted reception. We'll hear any incoming signal throughout the ship, and they can hear us from in here. <laughs> what do we do in the meantime? Uh, well, we are very fortunate to have Commodore Hanstein aboard. As you probably know, he's the most travelled Earthman in history. And I don't intend staying still for long here. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps, Commodore, you can suggest ways we can pass the time. All right, Captain. Do we have any books on board? Uh, do we? Oh, ah, there's one. Would you mind passing it up, please? Uh, and another. Oh, fine. 
We seem to have an overkill of the official tourist handle. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, what's this one about? Oh, I'm afraid it's only a, a little drawn through history. <laughs> the orange and the apple. Uh, it's absolute rubbish. Uh, oh, we're not looking for heavy literature. <laughs> the orange and the apple. The truth of the romance between Nell Gwynne and Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> it sounds juicy. <laughs> it was written by a promiscuous schoolgirl on Mars. Thank you, Miss Morley. Ah, I know this one. Shane, good old-fashioned western. Well, that's a start. Later on, we could have some volunteer readers, Captain. Good idea. Well, that's our entertainment taken care of. Are there any more questions? I noticed there was a spacesuit in the airlock. Well, couldn't someone swim up to the surface? Then the search party would know where we were immediately. Uh, sorry, Miss Morley, but it would be like swimming in sand. You'd be absolutely blind. How would the person know which was up or down? How could he close the outer door after him? The dust would just flood in. <laughs> if there are no more questions, why don't we all introduce ourselves? I'll go around the ship and perhaps you'll give your name, occupation and hometown. Yeah, you have a remarkable collection of talent on board, if <laughs> I may say so, Captain. Any sign of our rescuers? No, Commodore, not as yet. Uh, do you mind if I have a word, Captain? Uh, no, Mr... Uh... Mackenzie. Ah, uh, yes, our Australian physicist, correct? Correct, Commodore. Uh, I'm a little worried. Go ahead. Uh, what's it all about? If my reasoning is correct, a seven days limitation on our oxygen supply won't be our greatest danger. And what is? Heat. We're blanketed by dust. And it's about the best insulator there is. The heat from our bodies and the machinery can't escape. That means it'll get hotter and hotter until... Pff, we cook. I never give that a thought. How long do you think it'll take? Well, not much more than a day. It'll take me about half an hour to come up with a more accurate estimate. The cabin temperature readout will give us a fair indication. <laughs> yeah, he's right. It's gone up two degrees already. Yeah, a degree an hour. I was afraid it might be as bad as that. We'll have to increase the cooling, Pat. Won't that make matters worse? Yeah, I'm afraid so. All our refrigeration system does is pump heat out of the cabin. Now, there isn't anywhere for it to go. Well, check your figures, Mackenzie, and let us know how long we've got as soon as possible. Right. And uh, we'd better keep this between the three of us for the time being. Hello, Chief. Hi, Ed. Welcome to Port Roras. Anything new on Cellini, George? Oh, nothing good, Chief. We have a report from Lagrange Satellite and another from Plato Observatory, and get this, Commodore Hanstein's on board. Hmm. Aboard Cellini? Yep. Does Tourist Commissioner Davis know? Oh, he's taking it very personally, Chief. I oh, bet. Anything from the Duskies? Afraid not. I'll have to pull them in soon to change crews. Okay, but make it snappy. What does Lagrange say? Even with computer enhancement, they can't see anything out there. I suppose all her lights could be out. No lights, no radio. That would mean a breakdown of at least ten circuits. What does Plato Observatory have to say? Oh, it gets worse, Chief. At 1936 hours, they recorded a massive land slippage in the area of the Mountains of Inaccessibility. A violent moonquake. Hell. So that's what's happened. A lot of activity? Like nothing they ever recorded before. Are there likely to be further tremors? Well, they say very unlikely. Once the stress has been relieved, it isn't likely to happen again for a couple of thousand years. The time's about right for Cellini to have been slap bang in the middle of it. If they are buried under those rocks, they'll have had it by now. Mm. Cellini's hull would have cracked like an eggshell. Okay. Get the duskies back, George. I'm calling off the search in the Sea of Thirst. Get them fixed up with metal detectors and gas sniffers and head for the mountains when they've changed crews. It's time to pick up the pieces. Right, Chief. Ed, inform Dr. Lawson on LaGrange of the news. Thank him for his help and all that. I will do. That's it, then. I'd better speak to the administrator. And to Rex Davis, I suppose. Doctor, there's a message from Chief Engineer Lawrence thanking you for your efforts and saying the search has been called off. There's been a report of a moonquake causing an avalanche on the mountains of inaccessibility, and it, it seems that Cellini is crushed under the rocks. Blast! I was almost ready. What's that, Doctor? It's an old-fashioned infrared scanner linked up to the telescope. Quite enjoyed the challenge. All a waste of time, now. Those poor people. Isn't it still worth a try, Doctor? She might have survived the avalanche. 
Will it work in the mountainous area? No, of course not. There's been an avalanche and landslides. All the temperatures will be uneven. Complete waste of time. Sorry, sir. I don't know anything about them. Come here. Very basic. Though Cellini left no visible trace across the sea, she will definitely have left an infrared one. Do you understand? Not really. Oh, she'd have stirred up relatively warm dust from a few feet down and scattered it across a far colder surface. An eye that could detect heat could pick up her track for hours after she passed. It would have just been time for us to make a survey before the sun rose and obliterated all trace of the heat trail. Couldn't we still try it? No reason to, now. I'm still not sure how it works. Good gracious, Ingrid, look, it's fundamental. Now, all you have to do... Uh, Captain, Commodore, can I have a word with you? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, of course, Mac. Uh, how, how bad is it? It's bad. If conditions remain the same, we could have our first death from a heat strike within 20 hours. As soon as that. It doesn't give much time to find us and get us out, does it? No. If we slipped, that would lower the body temperatures. It'd help. It would make sense to sleep now before conditions become unbearable. And we could turn the main lights off. Right. We must give ourselves every possible chance. May I speak with them? With your permission, Pat? Yes, yeah, sure, Commodore. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we've all had a busy day, and I think most of us would be glad to get some sleep. In these conditions? I agree, Mrs. Schuster. You've probably all noticed that it's becoming a little warm in here, and my advice is to remove all unnecessary clothing. What do you mean by that? Now, comfort is much more important than modesty. We'll turn the main lights off and leave the emergency ones on. Somebody will remain awake all the time in the bridge, waiting for our rescuers. If anyone would like a drink or anything else, please don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Myra. Take off your dress. Be comfortable. Nobody's looking. Everybody's concerned with us all. That stewardess, Sue. If God had given me a figure like hers, I would undress. Myra Schuster stays covered up. Okay, Myra. I'd like to take the first watch, Captain. I can do some more calculations. Yeah, I'll, I'll be over there if you need me, though I doubt if I'll sleep. How did the meeting go, Chief? They're preparing a press release and messages to the next of kin. The administrator's going to come in for a lot of flack. And Tourist Commissioner Davies? Smooth as ever. <laughs> He's writing the press release. Wouldn't surprise me if he didn't try to make out it was a mass suicide to save his precious tourist Five industry. <laughs> oh, what's the situation with the dust skis, Ed? Oh, they've left for the mountains with the detection gear. And we're set up for a quick turnaround of crews. Fine. Well, let's hope we can give them a decent burial. I'm going for a drink. Pat, I'm sorry to wake you, but I can hear something. I wasn't asleep. What is it? Look, just put your ear to the howl. <clears throat> can you hear it? It's the dust moving. Thank God. They must have found no, us. I'm not sure. How's the temperature? It isn't going up as fast as I predicted. Because the lights and sleeping? It shouldn't have made that much difference. I don't understand. The noise. I think I do. Should we wake the others? No. This dust is so fine it'll flow like water in the right conditions. I think the heat is slowly dissipating into it and causing a convection current. I thought they'd found us. It's a bit of good news anyway if Cellini isn't heating up as quickly as we thought. The dust skis will be out searching. They could even be near us right now. Drowning your sodas, Chief. Oh. <laughs> On this stuff? <laughs> you know, we've beaten most of the killer diseases. And we can still lose 22 people out on a joyride. Uh, I know how you feel, Chief. The first ski is back. They're turning it round at the moment. Fine, Ed. Oh, and uh, Dr. Lawson from Lagrange Satellite wants to speak to you. Didn't you tell him about the mountains? Yeah, I told him earlier, but the message is he wants to speak to you. Oh, well, I'd better call him. Ed, use the extension. Yeah, right. Hello? Hello? Dr. Lawson? Speaking. Hello, Doctor. Chief Engineer Lawrence. Good. 
Selene, dear fellow, the missing tourist bus. Mm. I believe I know where she is. Yeah, in the mountains. No, no, she never got that far. Anyway, it won't work there. The temperatures are too uneven. No, it was while I was explaining the infrared technique to Ingrid. It, it, it's very simple, but she wanted a practical demonstration. And that's when we spotted the trail. The... Doctor, where have you found Selene? I, I, Ingrid has just sent the photograph over Telfax to you. I'll go and get them. Look, uh, yeah, could you start at the beginning, please? Certainly. You see, uh, after I was unable to locate any sign of your missing craft by conventional use of the telescope, I rigged up an infrared scanning device. Uh, th then the word came from you that you were calling off the search because Cellini was probably buried under the mountains. I was a little annoyed about that. <laughs> but uh, as I was explaining the method of heat detection to my assistant, Ingrid, we picked up Cellini's trail. It it's quite elementary. Here you are, Chief. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. Uh... Yeah, I, I have the I have the photographs in front of me now. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, I can see the trail, but I can't see the cruiser. That's a puzzle, isn't it? It seems as if she's just flown away. Doctor, she can't fly. I know that, of course. So if she can't go up, she must have gone down. He could be right, Chief. Mm. Uh, what are you saying, Doctor? Well, it's obvious to me she can't fly. There's no trace of her leaving that spot. So she must be under it. Ah, what about an explosion? She could have just disintegrated. Well, there'd be hot fragments all over the place. My infrared scanner would be going wild. Hell, Doctor, I hope you're right. Excuse me, one moment. Ed, contact Davis and tell him to hold any press releases. Tell him there's a slight chance she's under the sea. I want both dust skis holding here at base. Then, contact Plato Observatory and see if there could be a connection between the landslide in the mountains and that point on the sea of thirst. Sure, Chief. <clears throat> Dr. Lawson, how accurate is your infrared scanner? Totally. Depending on the range, of course. Mm. To what accuracy could you pinpoint the last location of Cellini? Well, not very well on this floating ping-pong ball. Um, well, say to roughly within half a kilometre. I see. That's still a wide area for such a small craft, but it's a very good start. I'll get the search party back out there straight away. Uh, there, there is another way. Mm, I'm listening, Doctor. You could do an infrared scan on the surface of the sea with a great deal of accuracy, but provided we did it before the next sunrise and the heat of the sun's rays obliterated all signs. Doctor, that's it. Brilliant. Quite. <laughs> I, I could be ready to leave in, what, say seven minutes, if you'd like me to come down. I feel like stretching my legs. <laughs> I'll see what traffic's like in your area. Have you picked up? See you soon. Goodbye. I've got both duskies back here waiting, Chief. What's going on? There may still be a chance. Cellini could be buried somewhere here, under the Sea of Thirst. Whew. Well, if her systems are still functional, they could still be alive. That's right. Ed, find a suitable craft in the region of Agrange to bring Doc Lawson and his machine down. Right, Chief. Uh, shall I get the skis to this location? Send one out with a surveyor's rod. There's no harm in trying. Tell them that I'm coming out myself as soon as Dr. Lawson arrives. Um, I'd like to drive, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Pat and Sue are friends of mine. Oh, sure, George. Contact Farside and ask for a loan of one of their skis. Have another crew wait for it here at a moment's standby. Right. Chief, uh, there's a ship, the Auriga, ten hours out from Earth, bound for Clavius City. There's time to divert it to Lagrange. That's fine, Ed. I'll do it. I have a feeling there'll have to be a few strings pulled. Keep Davis in touch with what's happening, but keep it low-key. We've an awful long way to go yet. Bluegrass down, Lester. I have a job to hear if there are any more messages. Just keeping my roots, man. Where is it we're going to? Lagrange Satellite, then diverting to Port Royce. Oh, Skipper. I had a little lady lined up in Clavius City. I had to cancel my own arrangements, too, Lester. And this diversion has come from the owners via the government. That important. Why are we going to Lagrange? Picking a guy up. He's got to be at Port Roar as soon as possible. Uh, better tell the passengers. Bet it's something to do with that tourist bus gone missing. We aren't supposed to listen to that security band. Or be a boring trip without it. That and my banjo. Go tell the passengers. Okay. Origa to Lagrange, ETA five minutes. What's it all about then, Lester? Mr. Spencer, all I know is diversion to LaGrange Observation Satellite and on to Port Roris, a one-horse town. Don't know how long we'll be there. 
had a hot one lined up in Clavy City. Even booked a restaurant. Ah, oh, you must have some idea. <laughs> you can tell me, Lester. Couldn't tell you, Mr. Spencer. I know you're a newsman. Even if I did know something, Skip would go mad. I have a 12-month contract on the moon. I'll be making lots of important contacts. Uh, anybody who does me a favor could be helping themselves for the future. Well, don't tell anybody I say it. I never reveal my sources. I reckon it's something to do with the missing dust cruiser. What missing dust cruiser? Skipper and me were listening to a security band. Shouldn't have been, though. Tourist cruiser Cellini's missing. 22 on board. Messed up my stay in port. Lester, will you get on back here? We're about to dock. Now, don't say I say it. We're picking a scientist up. Uh, hey, Lester, uh, you make sure he takes this vacant seat, huh? <laughs> See what I can do, Mrs. Spencer. That seat okay for you, Dr. Lawson? Uh, yes, thank you. Very comfortable. Uh, are you sure my luggage is safe? Oh, it'll be quite all right. Uh, what the hell is it anyway? Scientific equipment. Very sensitive. Be careful. Sure will. Bit of a late change of plan, Mr. Uh... Uh, Lawson. Dr. Lawson. My name's Spencer. Are you visiting Port Royce or a patient? No, I, I'm not a medical man. Astronomer, actually. Spot of bother in the Sea of Thirst. Fascinating. Oh, I don't know that area too well. Oh, I have some photographs. <clears throat> Now, see that line? Yes. Ah, you're a newsman. Does it show that much? Badge protruding from inside pocket. I'm a trained observer, you see. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, just catch a few minutes sleep. Knew it was going to be a busy day. I refuse to listen to any more of the orange and the apple. It's nothing less than pornography. But most people down to their underwear. <laughs> She's right, Myra. Most people are. It's roasting in here. You're gonna have to take your dress off. This is no time for modesty. It's time for goddamn comfort. Irving. Look, I'm sorry, Myra, but be sensible. Miss Morley, I can understand. You, I can. All right. Maybe we've had a little bit too much reading. But we can't sleep all the time. Does anybody have any ideas for recreation? Uh, uh, let us have an examination of the motives of people for traveling to the moon. That's a good idea, Professor... Uh, Jay uh, I came here because somebody told me I'd only weigh 20 kilos up here. That's why I came here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Do you feel comfortable in a spacesuit, Doctor? I've never worn one in my life. As long as you don't <laughs> suffer from claustrophobia. <laughs> if you could see the size of my laboratory aboard Lagrange, you wouldn't ask that question. <laughs> well, it's nice to be somewhere there's a bit of gravity. This oxygen flask looks a bit small. Oh, that's just your emergency supply. The main supply is on the dust ski. Now, let's get our helmets on. Right, Chief. <clears throat> <clears throat> How's that? Seems fine. Now, the only control you need worry about is the intercom. That's the panel on your right. It's switched on now, so we can talk quite freely. Any questions? What's this red button for? Emergencies. You won't need it, I hope. It sets off a homing radio beacon if you get lost. Uh, don't touch anything you aren't certain of, Doctor. Don't worry, I won't. OK, George. Ready to roll. Right. How long, George? Well, provided the quake hasn't caused any leaks or systems damage, they're okay for about uh, six days. How far down are they likely to be? Anybody's guess. Sea's never been plumbed out here, but the deepest dust bowl we've found so far was 41 meters. Uh, does the depth matter to the scanner? Just how do you intend getting them out? <laughs> it 
Good question, Doctor. <sighs> How do you manage to get the only genuine bottle of hooch in Port Roris, Mr. Spencer? The power of the press, Skipper. I had a bigger job getting these lunar survey maps. All right. So, uh, that's the Sea of Thirst, and that there'll be the mountains of inaccessibility where Selene's lost. Where she may be lost. Huh? Just between you and me, I believe the old man we picked up from the Grange satellite has evidence that she's down in that sea. I stuck close to Lawson. I know he was whizzed through customs and immigration, but the man who met him was Chief Engineer Lawrence, the man in charge of the rescue. He was overheard saying there was a dusky ready to take them out to the spot. Sure don't take you long to find your way around, huh? I'm a pro. I believe that spot there is where Selene is buried. If there are people still alive down there, there's going to be one hell of a salvage operation not too far from here. Port Roris will be the biggest news center in the solar system. Oh, where do I come in? Right there, Captain. Mm -hmm. I want to charter your ship to land me and my video equipment on that promontory, <laughs> on the western wall of the Mountains of Inaccessibility. <laughs> you realize how much that it costs? My station will pay. I've spoken to them, uh, and about a bonus for you and Lester. This could be one of the biggest news stories of the century. What do you say? Can it be done? Well, that's one good thing. There's enough food here for six days if we start rationing. Rationing? It seems a long time since you asked me to go to that new restaurant. <laughs> your, your friend must have been disappointed. You never asked me who it was, did you? <laughs> I thought if you didn't want to eat with me, that's your business. You shouldn't accept things at face value. Do you mean if I'd asked about the friend you were seeing the video with them... I mean... I know. But let's wait until we're out of here, okay? Everything all right, Doctor? No. It doesn't look too good, I'm afraid. But could we stop a moment? Sure. George? I heard you. What's the problem, Doctor? The heat image is too confused. There are dozens of hot spots. Now, I was expecting to find just the one where the dust has been disturbed. I see. Why was it uniform on the photographs? Gonna move on. It's gonna be a matter of minutes now, Chief. Right. How will you be able to differentiate between hidden rock and Cellini? Uh, presuming you hit something with your probe. Doctor, I just don't know. This could be it. Stop! Stop! Okay. Just look at the screen. Mm -hmm. I'll get the other dust ski over here. Let's get the probes rigged, George, and start praying. Now let's all settle down. They're doing their best. Settle down. The heat is getting to us. We've got to be patient. What's the trouble, Commodore? Ah, there's a feeling we're not doing all we can to get out. I've explained that we've no alternative but to wait for rescue. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we're at least ten meters down. Even if we could get the airlock open, no one could overcome the dust's resistance and get to the surface. But what about the main motors, Captain? We could try them. I doubt us moving a centimeter, and we go forward, not up. Well, we could all stand at the back. That would probably just damage the hull. But if there's one chance that it might work, isn't it worth the risk? Yeah. We're boiling down here. All right, then. It's enough from everybody. The danger in trying to escape unaided is too great. We're safe here for at least six more days. Six days. Might not be too comfortable. In fact, it'll get hotter. But we've got to stay calm and cooperative. Shut up! Shut up, everybody! Myra! Be quiet! Listen! Listen! Hey! They found us! Murder! They found us! I look back! I'll go and try the radio. I've hit something, but I can't tell what it is. It's Savini, all right. Just look at the trace on the screen. Uh. She's giving off an awful lot of heat. The surface of the dust is moving. 
Let's all just stand still. I don't think there's any cause for alarm. I think it's probably just a convection current. Okay, George. Follow the image of the scanner with Dr. Lawson and stake her out. Okay. Must be her. I've hit her again. She's deep, about 15 meters. This is the old-fashioned echo sound that couldn't be used. Yes. You may have something there, Doctor. And the next time I hit her, I'll leave the probe in. If it is Selene, she's blanketed by dust. That's why the radio didn't work. Yeah, I've hit again. I'll try the moon crash band. Yeah, it doesn't mean they're alive, though, George. That signal's unautomatic. Probably lasts about three weeks. I'll try our own frequency. <laughs> Loud and clear. This is Chief Engineer Lawrence, right above you. What condition are you in? As you can probably hear, you're a popular man at the moment, Chief. I'm Captain Pat Harris. We have no injuries. The hull is intact and we have oxygen and food supplies for about six more days. Our only cause for immediate concern is temperature. It's very hot down here. It was through heat detection we found you, Pat. And we should be making you a bit more comfortable before very long. We'll have you out as quickly as possible. I'll report back to base with the good news. I'll contact you soon and keep you all in touch with progress. Out. That's the word, Chief. Out. Lawrence to Port Roris Control, come in, please. Hello, Chief. It's Ed. Good news, Ed. We've found them. Radio contact established and everyone's okay but suffering from the heat. They have enough oxygen and supplies for six days. The problem is going to be getting to them through the dust. She's about 15 meters deep and three kilometers from the nearest solid land and we don't know how deep the dust is below her. I'm going to leave George here and the doctor and I will come back to base to organize rescue equipment. We can only use the skis out here. Now, how much equipment can any one ski carry? In total, about five tons. But because of balance, the largest single item they can carry is about two tons. So, we can't use any really heavy gear. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll do some thinking on the way back. Have that ski from far side standing by. Will do, Chief. Good work. Yeah, up to now it's been easy. But let's not kid ourselves. The hard part has just begun. Are we down, Skipper? Yes, sirree. We've all landed. It was a bit hairy, I must admit. Yeah, nothing in the master's handbook about a spaceship traveling 100 kilometers. Even the computer wouldn't be bothered with an efficient trajectory readout. I did let her rip upwards for a thousand kilometers and brought her down on a normal vertical approach with final auto guidance. <laughs> kind of neat, eh, Mr. Spencer? I didn't much care for free falling between the retros firing. <laughs> I kept wondering what would have happened if they hadn't fired again. Right into the moon. Mighty cheerful, Lester. Uh, here we are then, Mr. Spencer. Hope you're satisfied with the view. It's costing you enough. Oh, I hope you realize that the thousand-kilometer jaunt just qualified us for deep space rates. Have you no soul? There are 22 people buried out there. Uh, flying this rig is our living, amigo. I know how it is. All sweet talk and promises at the moment to get your story. Then when it's all old news and the accountants get involved in the cold light of day, uh, that's another story. Yeah, yeah, point taken. Oh, like a scene from a dream, isn't it? The sea stretching out into space. I, I can see what must be a, a dust ski. And, and even the pole joining Selene to the rest of humanity. Uh, where's that? Uh, here, you'll need the binoculars. I'll get the camera set up. This is fantastic. By the time anybody else gets anywhere near here... We'll have all the Earth networks tied up. What a picture. The plane, the probe stuck up into the freezing stillness. The loneliness of man personified in this huge and hostile universe you set out to conquer. Fancy some chow, Skipper. Smart idea, Lester. We could be here for some time. There's no 
a great sound. Listen, listen. That's 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 <laughs> Hello, Cellini. Rex Davis here. I just thought I'd leave you a moment with the sounds of Clavia City Park that await your return. Oh. On behalf of the chief administrator, I want to assure you that all the resources available on the moon are being mobilized for your aid. Engineering and technical staff are working around the clock to help you. Chief Engineer Lawrence tells me the provisional plan is to sink pipes down to you to ensure a limitless okay. oxygen supply. Oh, Sorry for the inconvenience and strain you've had to undergo. That's all over now. Just relax. Sit and wait. And we'll have you out in no time. Good luck. Best wishes. And we'll be in touch again soon. Uh, oh, I wish the commissioner wouldn't be quite so optimistic, Commodore. No, no. I'm sure he was just thinking about her morale. Well, it's been fine since the link was established. Uh, well, I'll be glad to get out of this. I'm getting too old for these sort of adventures. You've coped admirably, Commodore. I'm glad you were with us. Nice of you to say so, Captain. It's good to feel useful in retirement. I'm sorry to be so miserable just when everything has taken a turn for the better. Well, they're a bad headache, that's all. Yeah, I have a muzzy feeling myself. Must be to do with being cooped up for so long. What about these drums, Ed? Will they do? Tests show they'll support two tons before sinking. Fine. Get at least twice as many as we'll need. Uh, an important point, everybody. We must have all tools and spares tied down. Hmm? All tools to be attached to your belts. That's an order. Can't be wandering back to the stores once we're out at sea. Uh, we have problems with breaking through the roof, Chief. What's the trouble? Well, we've tried using a bar on the mock-up, but the roof's too springy and it bounces back every time it's hit. Ah, but will it happen when we're using a 15-metre pipe with dust packed round it? Do a test, see if it absorbs the recoil. Yeah, there's another problem. Uh, most of the control circuitry is in the roof, and it's too tough to put a clean hole through it. If it splinters, it could put one of her main systems out. Well, we'll have to bore. Use a detachable bit. How's the rest of the plumbing coming along? Oh, it should be ready in two or three hours, Chief. Good. I'll be back in two. Oh, blast. Lawrence. Hi, Mr. Lawrence. It's Dr. Lawson here. Oh, hello, Doctor. Did you sleep well? To my shame, yes, in a very long time. Oh, you had quite a day. Is there anything you need? No, thanks. I've been looked after extraordinarily well. I I'd just like some advice from you. Certainly. Anything at all. I appear during my hours of slumber to have become something of a celebrity in my own way, and I'm being inundated with questions from the media. Uh, but what shall I do? Just uh, tell them everything that happened. Enjoy yourself, Doctor. Well, it does seem rather decadent here in this luxurious hotel room. The Tourist Commissioner Davis said I could have anything I fancied. <laughs> rather a rash statement, I thought, but I'd like unlimited use of all the great facilities to study the planet Gregorian One. I'll consider it a personal favour if you keep the newsboys off my back. If you put it like that, I shall do my best. I'm sure you will, Doctor. See you later. I'm, uh, I'm sorry to make a fuss, Sue, but if you got something for my headache... Excuse me, I am also suffering. We do have some mild painkillers. I'll get them. Mr. McKenzie. Could you come through to the bridge? The captain would like to see us. Uh, yes, of course. Oh, if they're for a headache, I'd like some too. Yeah. Mac, I'm afraid we've got another serious problem on our hands. Another one? I'm afraid so. It appears we're experiencing a build-up of carbon dioxide. But I thought you were safe for another few days. Yeah, under normal circumstances, but unfortunately, I think the heat's affected the CO2 conversion system. How long do you think we got? Impossible to say accurately, but I'd say a matter of hours. That doesn't give Lawrence time to get here with his team. It could be a bit of panic. Oh, I'm not too delighted myself. Any ideas? Oh, there's always the sleep treatment. It would have the respiration rate. Well, that's all we can do then. I'll have a word with him while you radio through, Pat. Right. I'll come with you. Ladies and gentlemen. I'm afraid I have some grave news. You may have noticed some difficulty in breathing. And several people have complained of headaches. I'm afraid it's the air. We still have plenty of oxygen, but the carbon dioxide we breathe out isn't escaping. The chemical conversion unit has been affected by the heat. 
As we see it, there's just one chance. What? We must render ourselves unconscious. How can we do that? A sleep, our respiration rate is halved, and the air will last twice as long. Well, how do you propose we do that, Commodore? Sue, I take it the first aid kit is the standard issue. Yes, Commodore. Could you pass it, please? Oh. Now, this, for those of you who might not know, is a standard sleep tube. Sleep tube? Now, each tube is sufficient to render an adult instantaneously asleep and keep them asleep for approximately ten hours. I'm having none of it. Now, please, let me finish. We don't have any other choice. Two people will remain awake. One will be the captain. And I suppose the other one will be you. No. I'm taking the easy way out. Just to show you how harmless it is, I'll go first. Now, you just unscrew the top, put the send against your forearm, and press here. I'll see you all in ten hours. Sleep well, Commodore. There's no need to worry about that. This stuff just... Does the rescue base know our position? All that remains is to take a sleep tube. Ah, I see the Commodore has set us a good example. I'm a paying passenger and I have my rights. I have no intention of taking one of those. Miss Morley, I am not arguing with you. I am in total charge of this vessel and its occupants. I am tired, I am hot, and my head is banging. I'd much rather sleep, but it's my duty to stay away. Morley, we must help the captain. He must preserve the good air. Uh, please pass me one, uh, miss. Thank you, Professor. Let's not waste any more time. These are microjet hypodermics. You won't feel a thing. Here you are. Uh, please, thank you. Pass them away. This way, this way. I refuse to do it. What really worries the lady, Captain, is she thinks she'll take advantage of her while she's asleep. How dare you! I've never been so insulted. Neither have I. Oh, oh give me the damn thing. Don't come any closer. There. Sleep tight, Miss Morley. Everything will be all right. I know it will. Are you comfortable, Mr. Schuster? Oh, yes, thank you, sir. Look, Mara's already asleep. See you later. Salini to Chief Engineer Lawrence, Port Roris Control. Come in, please. Hello, Pat. Lawrence here. How did it go? More or less as planned. Myself and Duncan McKenzie are the only two left away. I'll give it to you straight, Pat. Even if we don't hit any snags, we can't reach you in under five hours. Can you hang on? We'll have to. Max getting the oxygen supply from the spacesuit. It's the passengers I'm worried about. All you can do is check their breathing and give them a blast of oxygen when it's necessary. We'll do our best. You can rely on that. Any more you want to say? No, I'll... Call you every quarter of an hour. Salini out. I've got the oxygen. You go first. All right. We'll take it in turns to keep a check on the passengers. Oh, I never thought breathing could be so enjoyable. Here, are, Pat. How long will this last? Uh, uh, about 12 hours between us. <laughs> and how much the others will need. What have you found to smile at? <laughs> well, sorry, I was just thinking I wouldn't have much chance if you decided to keep the bottle for yourself. I thought all you moonborn men were sensitive about that. Oh, no, it's never bothered me. Couldn't help being born in a gravity one-sixth of yours. How could you tell? Oh, your build, mainly. You all have the same tall, slender physique. And your skin... The lamps never seem to give the same tan as natural sunlight on Earth. I, I've never been to Earth and never will. Couldn't take the gravity. Looked Australia plenty of times through my telescope. Mm. I, I have a sentiment for it. My parents took off from Woomera. Oh, Woomera's an Aboriginal word meaning a booster stage for spears. Well, we'll live and learn. <laughs> I, I'd better go check the others. your story after all, Mr. Spencer, if that oxygen cylinder runs out. You sound a heartless man, Skipper. Ah, just one of life's realists. That right, Lester? Uh, I hope they get the poor devils out. 
Feel like a goddamn vulture sitting up here on a mountain shelf. Well, I hope it's going to be a rescue, not an exhumation. Have to be quick. Captain Harris didn't sound too perky last time he reported in. Salini calling Lawrence. Come in, please. Pat, we aren't far away. I can see the probe. It won't be long now. At last. It's, it's the heat as well as the carbon dioxide. I know. Don't talk unless it's absolutely necessary. I'll leave this wave band open, and I'll do the talking. I'll let you know everything that's going on, okay, Pat? All right. My God, this is better than I could have hoped for. We'll go on air as soon as you can take me. I'll do the intro, uh, and then you can pick up Lawrence on the security radio wavelength and let him do all the work, huh? <laughs> My uh, chew out will be, uh, uh, the next voice you hear will be that of Lawrence himself. about the epic struggle for survival and all that? This could be the greatest event in live television, and I must insist on silence. That's if you want a big fat bonus, huh? What do you say, Skipper? Lester, shove that cotton-picking banjo and keep your mouth shut. You'll be on air in five seconds from now. Four, three, two, one. This is Morris Spencer, coming to you live from the Sea of Thirst, Earthside, the Moon. The points of light you see on the right of your screens is Chief Engineer Lawrence and his gallant crew of rescuers. The probe sticking starkly from the surface of the sea is the only link 22 people entombed in the dust cruiser Cellini have with the rest of humanity. I'm going to leave the man in charge of the rescue, Chief Engineer Lawrence, to describe his plans to bring the 22 people to the surface, as he is in direct contact with Captain Pat Harris of the stricken craft. I'll leave the hellish conditions down there to your imagination. It's very hot and there is a serious buildup of carbon dioxide. Let us pray to our own God that Lawrence can get them out of there in time. The next voice you hear will be that of Lawrence himself. Uh-oh. We got big trouble, Mr. Spencer. I have tourist Commissioner Davies on a priority channel. Hell. Okay, I'll handle him, Skipper. All right. Hello, Commissioner Davies. Uh, how are you? I don't know how you got there so quickly, Spencer, but you've got one minute to get off the air. Don't you have any sense of moral decency? I'm just doing my job the best way I know how, Commissioner. Off in one minute, or your channel loses its franchise. Uh, let's not get excited, Commissioner. What's the problem? We have nothing to discuss, Spencer. I've got one of the greatest news items in moon history. That's what we've got to discuss. Now, uh, calm down, Commissioner, and, uh, let's look at it from your point of view. What the hell do you mean? Uh, strictly between us, Commissioner. Think positive, huh? What way can this tragedy benefit you and your department? I don't think I follow you. Uh, you must be going through a pretty hard time, huh? Tourist boss with 22 people incarcerated. It doesn't look uh, too bright for the future, does it? What are you getting at? I think we could be men who uh, understand each other. You could break me and my station, but in the minute I take to get off the air, I could break you. Are you threatening me? Damned right I am. But I'm also offering you a deal. I don't have to take this from you. Commissioner, I have an audience of 200 million people and rising by the minute. I could tell them what a job you've done here on the moon what tourism is like here and what it could be. I could have your hotels and pleasure domes overflowing. We've got the solar system sat on the edge of their seats, Commissioner. What do you say? We're here, Pat, right above you. Would you believe there's a spaceship just on the ledge in the mountains waiting for all of you to come out and take your photographs? Well, I must remember to comb my hair. <laughs> Why didn't you land there and save time? Wouldn't have saved time, Pat. The ledge is too high, and there are too many rocks to climb. We'd have spent longer getting our equipment down from there and across the sea. How are you? Uh, Max giving oxygen to Mrs. Schuster. She's in a bad way. It seems to be getting foggy in here. Or is it just me? We're ready to drill now. Right. I, th I think the... Bottle's nearly empty, though. We're on our way. The first section's five meters down. Hang on. Yeah, I, 
I'll just have a sleep until you come in. No, Matt. No, keep awake. Talk to me. Uh, uh, how's Mac? Uh, who? who? Mackenzie. Oh. Is he awake? Why is it so foggy in here? I've only seen fog on videos. God damn it, Ed. We should have made the drill detachable from the surface. He isn't going to have the strength. Well, we had to risk it. There wasn't time to improve it. It's there. It's there. We've hit the roof. Pat, Pat, do you hear that? The first pipe is there. Can you hear it? Yeah, I, I heard you. You're on the roof. Listen very carefully. You're seconds away from fresh air, but this is very, very important. We will bang it a couple of times, and you have to tell us if it is clear of the circuitry. Uh, Do you understand? Uh, uh, Pat. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Start the drill. We've got to risk it now. Pat, listen. This is very important. Your pressure down there is greater than up here on the surface. Do not undo the bit until we tell you, or air will escape up the pipe. Do you understand that? Do not undo the bit. We didn't have time to fit a non-return valve. We're through, Chief. Mac! Mac, it's through! That's through! Thank God. Coleman, Matsui, help George with the oxygen line. Chief, I think he's not doing for me. Mac, Mac, Captain Harris! Do not, Whippy, do not disconnect the bit until I tell you. It's too late. He's going to want to thank you. Get that generator at full pressure. Commissioner Davies, there's a huge jet of uh, mist or something, like, a, like a, a geyser shooting up in the air. Yes, I can see it on my set. I must comment on it to my viewers. Is that agreed then, Mr. Spencer? Yes, Commissioner. It's been a pleasure doing business with you. If that uh, geyser means they're all dead, I still want the same arrangement. Is that agreed? Of course. And no comments at all from Lawrence? That's already been actioned. We can all benefit from this, Commissioner. I, I, I put a book over the end of the pipe. The air was going out instead of in. It's uh, gotten very dark in here. You had us all scared there for a moment, Pat. Everything's going to be all right. Okay, George. Pat, we're going to blast that book away with the sweetest smelling oxygen you've ever known. <laughs> That's fantastic, Chief. Mac! Mac! Come and lie over by the pipe. Mac, you okay? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. Why is it so dark? It got through to us. The main lights are out. I went asleep. No, it doesn't matter. They aren't all breathing properly. Can you give artificial respiration? Yeah, sure. But, Mr. Schuster's a strange colour. Well, do what you can. How's it going down there? Uh, hang on. Give us a few minutes. We've got to give some artificial respiration. Uh, Mrs. Schuster's breathing. Yeah, I, I think we might make it. We're giving you oxygen at the lowest temperature we think is safe. So uh, don't be alarmed. When we've cooled you down, let us know. How are they, Mac? Well, they, they're all alive up to now. I think we're going to be all right. Pat, in about five minutes, we'll be sinking the second pipe. We'll bang on the roof again to make sure we are clear of your controls. It's looking good, Pat. As you can see through the transparent dome that encases the rescuers, the first stage, uh, dropping an independent oxygen supply to the stricken Cellini, has now been completed. 
Another pipe, a vent pipe, is now being lowered by Chief Engineer Lawrence and his crew to complete the respiratory circuit. As the rescue continues to unfold live on this channel, I cannot help, even with a lump in my throat, thanking the good Lord for granting us people like Chief Engineer Lawrence working under the leadership of Tourist Commissioner Rex Davis. I've, I've tried repeatedly to talk to the Commissioner on the air, but he won't budge from his single-minded task of getting these people out alive and well. Perhaps he'll speak to us later. You're through, Chief. Okay, Pat. Now unscrew the bit, and then you can relax just a little. <laughs> Is there anything you require urgently? No, I don't think so. I'm going to get the main lights back on before they all wake up. Fine. Our equipment above you is being pressurized now, so that should make our work a little more comfortable and avoid the danger of any more air escaping. <laughs> Once you're out of there, we'll ferry you back to base in fours or fives after a preliminary check by medics. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a sneeze. It's getting quite cool down here now. All right. All right, we'll put the oxygen temperature back to normal. The ski boat from far side is just arriving. Nearly there, Pat. Okay. <coughs> uh, breathe deep, everyone. We have fresh air again. Pat, uh, how are we doing? Oh, so far, so good, Commodore. Breathe deep. I'm just unscrewing the vent pipe. Yeah. Come on, Sue. Wake up. <coughs> Breathe. Enjoy the oxygen. Oh, oh, it's so cold. We're going to be all right. What's happened? They got through to us, oh. Professor. Breathe. Oh, that's oh, oh, my God. My goodness. Uh, that's much better. Make sure anyone who is still asleep is breathing normally and keep them warm. I'll do a tour right, of inspection. Yeah. Good girl. Oh, that air. You okay, Mac? Yeah, terrific. Oh. Mrs. Schuster, you had me worried for a while. Good to see you, Mr. McKenzie. <laughs> Irving, you're sleeping in. It's a vacation, Myron. <laughs> you sure you're all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Did I snore, Mr. McKenzie? Myron, 40 <laughs> years married. You still amaze me. Well, I'll get the main lights back on. Just relax. All right. How did he propose to get us out, Pat? I think you'd better ask Chief Engineer Lawrence, Commodore. Come under the bridge with me. Hey, what's happening anyway? Pat. Yes, Chief. We've stabilized pressures now. We'll have to give you a boost now and again, but most of the time the pipes will be open it. Great. Uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce Commodore Hanstein to you. Very pleased to talk to you, Chief. Thanks for the fresh air. My pleasure, Commodore. What's the plan to get us out, Chief? At the moment, we've just rigged up an igloo above you. That means we don't have to work in space suits. And when you come up, you'll be in a pressurized atmosphere. We're going to use a large sectional cylinder that'll sink under its own weight. We've more than enough sections to reach you, and the pressure of the tube will make the seal. Then we'll have a sort of well shaft down to you, and I have the dubious honor of cutting through Salini's roof. That sounds straightforward enough. We're starting now. The sections are sealed with a rather flimsy material that stops the dust coming up, but won't stop me getting down. We seem to be in capable hands, Pat. Yes, I think we are. Oh, you look tired, Pat. Uh, well, I feel it. <laughs> Mackenzie was a great help. Is everybody all right? They've all come through it very well. We're down more than eight meters, more than halfway. Pat. Yeah, man? How far down was the oxygen pipe when it first entered the cabin? About a meter. Take a look now. Hmm? I see what you mean. Uh, Chief, have you pulled the vent pipes up at all? No, there's been no need. We're still sinking. The dust must never have settled. We're within half a meter of you. Almost there. When that tube hits us, it might shove us down. Lawrence, we're still sinking. You'll have to give us more airline and make it quick. What the hell, sir? The suction pump from Sydney is out of the ship and in the dust. We're pulling dust. Switch it out. Sally, what's happening? Ah, the rear pipe's out. Dust spraying in. And we're tilting. The airline's out. Dust's coming in from both. Did you get that? Yes, okay. Here, get those pipes out. Oh, 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 oh
The dust is exploding everywhere. Now we must jam the holes. Uh, use my shirt. Commodore, will you block the other one, please? I can't see. My eyes are full of dust. Now hang on, I'm coming your way. The night is still on. It's the dust. You all right, Commodore? I've managed to jam the hole, I think, but I can't see a thing. My eyes are clogged up with the dust. Pat, Pat, they broke again, but it's gone into the panel. Lawrence, can you hear me? You've drilled into the control panel. Take it up and come rear it. Well, everybody stay calm. Cover your mouths and noses up with clothing. Yes, go ahead. Mac, be ready to detach the bed. Get, get through to us. Oh, thank God. Yes. At least you've got All right, now let's get that settled down the roof. Come on, uneven keel. You won't see a problem enough. Okay. They've had a gun. Okay, could you be quiet, please? Be quiet, everyone, please. We have to listen to this. Well, you're right. Shush. I'll cut a hole in the hole, then you pull me up again. you out. The bridge door isn't going to hold. How many people are out, sir? Eleven. Halfway there. Well, keep them moving. Come on, Myra. Get up there. I'm not leaving. You're having... I'll get stung. Put her up. She can't climb. Myra, please. Goodbye, Myra. <laughs> What's happened? I can't see. The bridge door's gone. There's a tidal wave of dust from the bridge. Oh, grab that hand quickly, someone's got it. Okay. Come on. Come on, Come on Miss Morley, I've got Come you. On, yeah. Uh, Come on, Dolly. Come on, Dolly. How There's just the four of us. If anybody's buried, they're lost. You're next, Commodore. Uh, Sue's still here, she should be. Get up there and don't waste time. Oh, You're next, too. That's plenty uh, with the girl. Go, Mac. Hang on the letter, Pat, or you'll go under. Don't worry uh, about me. I'll be okay. There's just the captain left. Drag him up. Drag him up. Come on, Ben. I will we lose him. Go, go. He's coming up. Oh, are you all right, Pat? Welcome aboard, Pat. There's Lawrence here. I can't open my eyes, Chief, but... It's good to hear you. I can't see you either, but the medics are just arriving. Make them comfortable, Ed. You did a great job, Lunch. I've never been so frightened in all my life. Thought for a moment I was going to join you. Well, what the hell caused in the first place? Moonquake. A chance in a million. And I always thought I had a nice, safe job. Confirmation has just arrived that all 22 passengers and crew buried in the dust cruiser Cellini have been rescued unharmed by Chief Engineer Lawrence and the team put together by Tourist Commissioner Davis. They're all alive and well. After a chance in a million moon dust fall, the rescue operation has been a total success. 
And we now have a live interview with the man responsible for all tourism on the moon, Rex Davis. Commissioner. Please, call me Rex. I must apologize for not speaking to you earlier, but I had other things on my mind. Even though I had 100% confidence in Jim Lawrence and his crew, I felt it my overriding responsibility to be on hand at all times. We understand, Rex. Was there ever a time when you thought they may be lost? No, not for a second. If this mishap has taught us anything, it's that the personnel on the moon are equipped to deal with any emergency. And as man becomes even more adventurous, we will be tested again and again. And again and again, we will prove ourselves equal to the task. <laughs> Why, even now, there's a man who wants to pioneer dust skiing as a sport. Uh, do you mean like uh, water skiing? Exactly. Out there, on the sea of thirst. <laughs> Isn't that an exciting prospect? It is indeed, Rex. Uh, I see, as we speak, more of the team of highly trained medics are arriving at the rescue point, just as planned. When do you think the passengers and crew will be available for interview, Rex? Oh, now, uh, Morris, we don't want to rush these people. Let's give them a chance to experience some lunar hospitality, all courtesy of the tourist board, of course. <laughs> well, I think you know best, Rex. Who is this uh, enterprising man who wants to pioneer dust skiing? He's an Australian champion. And I have high hopes that he will be only the first of many who will wish to visit the Sea of Thirst. Who knows? It could even become the moon's main recreation center. In A Fall of Moon Dust by Arthur C. Clarke, adapted for radio by Andrew Lynch, David Buck played Captain Pat Harris, Barry Foster, Engineer Jim Lawrence, Roland Caram, Tourist Commissioner Davis, Bill Simpson, Commodore Hanstein, Richard Pearson, Dr. Lawson, James Aubrey, Morris Spencer, Libby Morris, Myra Schuster, Harry Taub, Irving Schuster, and Jane Knowles, Stewardess Sue Wilkins. Miss Morley was played by Brenda Kay, Mackenzie by John Rye, Professor Jer Wedner by Saeed Jaffrey, Skipper by Ed Bishop, Lester by Guy Gregory, Ed by Hayden Wood, George by David Timpson, Ingrid by Christine Absalom, and Anne by Amanda Murray. The banjo was played by Peter Sayers. A Fall of Moondust was directed by Glyn Dearman.